Hi, welcome to another episode of Catch This. My name is Trudy Ray, and I like to talk about viruses. Viruses are universally defined as obligate intracellular parasites because they cannot replicate outside of the host cell and depend on that cell and its various metabolic factors for replicating their genome. Based on this definition, most virologists agree that viruses are not alive. Today I want to discuss giant viruses. What are giant viruses and exactly how giant are they? We typically think of viruses as being very, very small, and they are. But on this small scale, which would be the nanometer scale, with most viruses ranging from about 20 to about 300 nanometers in size, there are the really big viruses like Mimi viruses and Pandora viruses, for example. Pandora viruses can be as large as 750 to 1000 nanometers, which is one micrometer. So now we're in the micrometer range. So that has raised the following questions. Because these viruses are so big and encode so many genes, could they possibly be alive? And do they constitute a fourth domain of life? When giant viruses were initially discovered, they were found to violate multiple principles of virology. For example, Mimi viruses can be parasitized by other viruses. There are these small virus-like entities called virophages that can only replicate if they co-infect a cell with another virus, like with a Mimi virus, for example. During this co-infection, they confiscate the replication factors of the Mimi virus, and they also inactivate the Mimi virus. Some think of this as a virus infecting another virus, a previously unheard of phenomenon. If a virus is so dependent on cells for everything, then how can it be parasitized itself? But the story doesn't end there. Mimi viruses can fight right back against the virophages. They have defense mechanisms that inhibit virophage replication, a property that is kind of similar to antiviral interferon mediated defenses in eukaryotic organisms. That's pretty complicated for a virus. Additionally, Mimi viruses also encode proteins that participate in protein synthesis, another unusual property for a virus. Recently, researchers have discovered that some Mimi viruses also have a gene that codes for citrate synthase, an enzyme involved in the Krebs cycle, also known as the TCA cycle, and also known as the citric acid cycle, as you may remember from high school, or maybe not. I know, when you learned about the Krebs cycle in high school and college, you promptly forgot about it and you thought you were done with it. But when you take a closer look at it in the context of the cell and a living organism, it's actually pretty cool. Let's take a look. The Krebs cycle is integral to cellular metabolism in living organisms because it ultimately powers the production of adenosine triphosphate. That's right. ATP, the cell's molecular currency of energy. The cycle takes place in the matrix of the mitochondrion, which as everybody knows is the powerhouse of the cell. It has an outer membrane and this convoluted inner membrane with an intermembrane space in between. And then there's the matrix in the middle. So this is where the Krebs cycle takes place, where it gives off these electrons that end up in the string of complexes in the inner mitochondrial membrane known as an electron transport chain. As electrons move down this chain, they release energy. And this energy is captured by these proton pumps inside the inner membrane, which pump protons, denoted as hydrogen ions here, from the matrix across the membrane into the intermembrane space. So the word pump implies that it requires energy and that energy comes from the electrons as they move down the chain. Now, as you get this increased number of protons on one side of the membrane compared to the other, you end up with what is known as a concentration gradient, which is a difference in the concentration of protons on one side compared to the other side. This is also known as a membrane potential. To achieve equilibrium, because that's the driving force for a biological system, the protons move back into the matrix through the action of another membrane-resident enzyme called ATP synthase. 
ATP synthase does exactly what its name implies. It synthesizes or makes ATP by capturing the energy of the protons. In other words, a concentration gradient across a membrane produces an electrical potential and is usually associated with the ability to generate energy in living cells. Based on the knowledge that some miniviruses encode a component of the Krebs cycle, a group in Marseille, France, wanted to determine whether giant viruses can produce their own energy. So the rest of this episode is based on this preprint right here. To see whether these giant viruses can make their own energy, the authors infected a species of amoeba, the natural host of giant viruses, with Pandora virus massiliensis, a virus with the largest known viral genome, encoding many different proteins of unknown functions. So the authors infected the amoeba with P. massiliensis and then isolated viral particles from these infected amoeba and treated them with two things. Antibodies that were specific to P. massiliensis, the virus, and a dye that detects electrical potential. This technique produced fluorescence in the membranes of P. massiliensis particles, and this fluorescence indicated the presence of an electrical potential, in contrast to control virus particles isolated from cells infected with cowpox virus, which did not fluoresce at all. The authors wanted to confirm that the observed fluorescence represented a real concentration gradient with potential for electron transport. So they treated the P. massiliensis particles with CCCP, which is a chemical that inhibits movement of electrons. So it basically prevents the electron transport chain. This treatment led to a diminished membrane fluorescence with increasing concentration of the chemical. And this suggested that the observed membrane potential was real. Now, interestingly, the intensity of the electrical potential could be modified with addition of variable concentrations of acetyl-CoA, which is a known regulator of the Krebs cycle. Next, the authors wanted to determine how the P. massiliensis genome could play a role in energy metabolism. So they did a sequence alignment with a database of conserved sequence domains known to be involved in energy metabolism. This showed that this virus, P. massiliensis contains genes for nearly all enzymes in a Krebs cycle. But when these genes were cloned and expressed in bacterial cells, only one of them, isocitrate dehydrogenase, was functional. The authors also found that mature P. massiliensis particles released from amoeba cells did not produce any ATP. So this makes sense. If you only have one functional enzyme in this cycle, the cycle as a whole won't function and you don't get ATP. However, when amoeba cells were infected with P. massiliensis that were pre-treated with CCCP, the chemical that prevents an electron transport chain, these amoeba produced a lower number of viral particles, suggesting that the observed membrane potential might play a role during infection. The authors conclude that these findings position this virus as a form of life. I disagree with this conclusion for several reasons. Although P. massiliensis encodes numerous Krebs cycle enzymes, as was shown in the paper, only one of them seems to be functional. Also, P. massiliensis particles did not produce any ATP, meaning that this virus can't produce its own energy. And even if it did, it still depends on the host cell for many other replication factors, including those needed to make proteins. In my opinion, as long as a virus requires a cell for replication and can't replicate outside of that cell, it is still a virus and hence not alive. Still, these findings are interesting and remind me of bacteriophage Phi Kappa Zeta. I discussed this virus in one of my previous blog posts at Virology Blog. Check it out. Long story short, Phi Kappa Zeta assembles a nucleus-like shell which shields the viral DNA from bacterial immune enzymes. Any discovery that reveals genes and viruses that suggest the potential for cell-like functions raises at least a couple of questions in my mind. Are these genes remnants of cellular genes, thereby suggesting that these viruses originated from ancient parasitic cells? Or did these giant viruses acquire the genes over time to gain more independence from host cells? We don't know. Either way, Pandora viruses are aptly named because their study continues to yield surprising discoveries. Thanks again for listening. My name is Trudy Ray. 
I'll see you next time on Catch This.